Good morning and welcome back to the channel. Last time we stopped with double FATEC uh, framing systems of overlapping timbers that are not fastened to each other and that really are uh, held together only by the planking, the ceiling and the external planking in the wheels of the vessel. In this system, what becomes practically obvious is that the planking of the vessel must be carried out simultaneously with the framing of the ship. So as you cross the floor timbers, you begin the planking of the vessel. Once you reach the wrong heads of the floor timbers, you add the first fatics. In this stage, you start adding the ceiling planks inside in order to sandwich the timbers together. Once you reach in the planking stage up the bilge and cover most of the first fatic, and you have acquired enough height, you have to install the second fatics, which are butting into the wrong heads of the floor timbers. And you continue planking all the way up the side. This necessity changed. In other words, the point of this conversation is that he, until really the final years of the 17th century, for all practical purposes, it was not a, possible to raise a skeleton of a vessel, the framework of the ship, without the planking going on. You couldn't just raise the frame, leave them in peace to season for a year or two, and then go back and plank it as it was possible in the 18th century. And as it was done with many ships in the 18th century, to wit, Victory, Bellona, etc., they were built in this way with significant periods of uh, leaving the ships open from planking on only partially planked to season the timbers. Towards the end of the 17th century, and it is hard to tell who is the first one to think of this system, we begin to see the double sawn frame construction that really continued to, uh, in existence to the end of wooden boat building. Since wooden ships are still being built, uh, here and there. In essence, this is the frame, uh, framing style that continues to the present day. At the moment, the earliest example of this that I can think of, the completely assembled double sawn frame construction rather than overlaying timbers, comes from the wreck of Sieur de La Salle's vessel La Belle. This does not mean that this is the first ship that ever had this system. It only means that it is the earliest physical evidence that we so far have. Or at least I'm not aware of any earlier wreck being excavated with the same system. Another vessel that shows the same construction, and again is a French origin, uh, origin is of course Hazardieu, or Hazardieu. My French is practically non-existent, so I apologize to the native French speakers of this channel. Uh, that vessel shows exactly the same construction with double sewn frame constructions, no can frames, though can frames will be discussed in a separate video, and square frame going all the way up into the stem of the vessel. In its simplest and most basic form, this is what these timbers look like. You can see the floor timber, the second fatak, the first fatak right over here, a third fatak added, and all of them overlap. Each timber is overlapping the joints from the, uh, between the neighboring timber. Although I have not drawn it in this instance, these timbers are going to be fastened fore and aft with bolts or trunnels. Uh, depending on the boat building tradition, sometimes a combination of the two. So with this frame, you actually can assemble the frame. You can raise it on the keel. You will need, obviously, supports and braces to keep it in position, but you do not need the planking to raise. If you remove the entire planking of the vessel, the frames will still hold together as it is. What were the advantages of this system? Well, for one thing, you could use shorter pieces. As I said, by the end of the wooden warship, they were using up to 11, 12 pieces per side for this vessel. So this is a major advantage. You can use shorter, straighter pieces to frame the vessel and therefore cheaper timber. 
not only cheaper in the sense of availability, but also transportation costs. And that is an important advantage. The second, and what I consider to be even more important advantage, or at least that's what I have argued in my master's thesis, is that um, this is a much stiffer frame. There is less flexibility and therefore less chance of the ship spitting out its uh, oakum. It is a system that appears to have been in a modified vessel. So, uh, the system where each frame is a doubled frame around seems to be a French origin. And the English, even when they start using this double sawn frame construction, they usually are separated. These are the frames that are represented on the lines drawings of the vessel. They're every third or every fourth, even uh, the so-called molded frames. In between the space, however, is filled up with uh, single timbers, so-called filling uh, frame timbers. That is very, very considered uh, on the part of the master shipwrights, both the French and the English. They have deeply simplified the work of the archaeologists. This way, we can almost always determine whether we're talking about a British tradition shipbuilding or French tradition shipbuilding, even before the artifacts and the positive identification of the site can tell us. So I'm deeply grateful to the Grand uh, Masters of old. On the previous image that I showed you, I showed you the simplest version of these, where the timbers are simply squared and placed together, but that is about it. This is how many American ships were built in later periods, but the Royal Navy adopted a slightly different style with anchor chocks that locked each of the timber to each other. Not only is this timber held because it is backing into another one, but it is also held, it is uh, firmly fastened to its to <coughs> timbers in the sequence. So the floor timber would be chalk scarfed into the fa second fatak, the second fatak into the top timber if we have only uh, two or three fatak system. The earliest illustration of this that I'm aware of is coming from a series of drawings from the later 17th century, probably around 1676-77, known as the Thomas Fagg uh, drawings, F-A-G-G-E. <clears throat> I have seen them before, and uh, in more recent times, Richard N. Uh, published them in his book on the warship N, one of the 20, 70 gun third rate ship of the line that King Charles II persuaded Parliament to partially fund what he didn't fund himself. An interesting question, of course, uh, uh, those drawings, the Thomas Fagg drawings, are showing this chalk. Uh, frames. Obviously, here I have drawn them rather regular. They are not always quite so regular in the archaeological uh, record, but the point is there. This is what they are aiming at. What is the advantage of these anchor chocks? Well, it is twofold. First of all, and probably this is how they emerged when I was still a master's uh, student. Professor Jonathan Adams was kind enough to have a long conversation with me in his office about chalk scarves and framing, since after all he is one of two, three top specialists in the world together with professors uh, Kevin Chrisman, Fred Hawker, Jamal Pulak, uh, among the people that I trust most with ship construction. And of course, on the French side, Professor Eric Riet. But uh, the conversation, initially the chocks almost certainly were introduced not so much uh, for beauty and regularity, but because they were filling up missing bits and pieces of the timbers. It was not so much because the master shipwrights thought, oh, uh, this is going to create a much stronger uh, shape, a uh, much stronger joint between the timbers. It is because, oh dear, the timber I have does not have the right curvature and I cannot make it fade into the wrong head of the floor timber. But how about if I add a chalk, then I can use a slightly straighter timbers that do not quite have the curvature I would like to have, but with the help of the chalk, I can achieve it. 
This sort of chalk has been documented on the remains of uh, the warship Anne, which is off Rye on the southern uh, English coast. And uh, unfortunately, the, ve the vessel is uh, frequently visible at very low tides. Unfortunately, no real systematic documentation and excavation has been carried out, although there have been conversations in the past about doing it. So, by the 1670s, it is clear that uh, chalk scarves were used in putting timbers together. One of the interesting wrecks of the period, and one of the few very well excavated, documented, and uh, published wrecks, is that of the frigate Dartmouth. The excavation was carried out by Professor Colin Martin, and it is a model of how such a partially preserved wreck should be excavated and should be published. It is one of the articles and studies that have been most influential over my early career, and it is the sort of style documentation and uh, information extraction that I have aimed to achieve with my own work. I, these are my redrawings of the plans that uh, Colin Martin published in uh, the International Journal for Nautical Archaeology, because obviously I used them to illustrate specific points that I was interested in uh, and for our purposes. This is the site plan. This is only a fragment. In reality, the ship survived slightly farther forward and there are fragments of frames even uh, forward towards the bow. But There, the frames are too poorly preserved to uh, give us the information, the points of discussion that I would like to uh, address here. So, here you see the timbers. These are the ceiling planks. Actually, these are the foot whaling here of the vessel, as Professor Martin has identified. This is uh, dead wood, for lack of a better word, and on the outside is the outside planking. These frames are here in sequence shown. As you can see, there is a full timber that initially, once upon a time, would have crossed the center line of the vessel. Then there is another one that, uh, actually, no, this one would not cross. This one would have crossed the center line of the ship. And there is another timber butting into it. Then we have this complete timber that is coming from close to the keel, but not quite there and extending up the side. Then the next one again, are two pieces. So let me show you this in a different image and I will try to explain what is the significance of this from point of view of our conversation. I will start with the more complicated view. You see the timbers here. Ignore these lines here because these are chucks that have uh, been used to repair the frames at the time of the rekeeling of the vessel which happened in 1677-78. The vessel uh, underwent extensive repairs and the keel was changed. By this stage, she was over 20 years old, so definitely needed it. And at the end, she uh, was lost during King William's War or the War of the League of Augsburg in the Sound of Mo, while trying to suppress the Stuart supporters in Scotland. So here you see a timber, a chalk, and the next timber butting into it. Here you see the same thing. There is an, another timber in between these two, but the next one, we see a timber, see a second timber, they're connected with a chalk. And again, and again. These timbers, because of this chalk, because all of them end at approximately the same uh, position, these timbers, in reality, are identified as the floor timbers. And the ones that you see here poorly preserved, these would have been the second futex of the vessel. And in between them are the first futex. As you can see, there are no chucks on them. They are forming the curvature at the turn of the bilge completely on their own. This is what they are uh, really documenting. So, compare positioning these together. 
This here is a first Fatak. This one to be exact. This here is one of the timbers over here, floor timber with a second Fatak. And they are connected with chocks everywhere. And really it is these chocks that I wanted to address. This is the earliest English or British evidence for the use of chocks. An interesting conversation, and this is where we will end today's video, an interesting conversation is whether these chocks were part of the original construction of the vessel or were they later addition as a result of the repairs. The jury is still out on this, but when you see something that is quite so consistently done, one of the ways to do it is, of course, with Dendru, if there is significant uh, survival. The other one is matching the records of the repairs with what is there. As I said, Colin Martin has published this ship in detail. I heartily recommend his articles on the subject. One of them is in the International Journal of Nautical Archaeology. The other one is in one of the edited volumes on uh, archaeology or excavations of warships. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to finish the video. Thank you so much for your attention. Again, if you have questions, I, when I can, when I have access to internet, I will do my best to answer them. So thank you so much for watching. A huge, huge thank you to the sponsors who actually donate to the channel. I'm very grateful. And I wish you a most wonderful and relaxing rest of the day to you. Thank you.